welcome to Fueling the Transition, the podcast from A3 Management Consulting. I'm Matt Brown, Vice President in the Management Consulting Division at A3. And this is the podcast where we examine everything to do with decarbonization, decentralization, and digitalization of the energy industry. I'm very pleased today to have with us Tamsin Lishman, who is the Chief Revenue Officer at Energy Nest. Hi, Tamsin. Hi, and thank you for having me. I've also got Alex Blankley with me, who's a Principal Consultant at uh, AFRI. Hi, Alex. Hi, Matt. Diving straight in to Energy Nest. What is Energy Nest? What do they do? So in simple terms, Energy Nest has a patented thermal battery, and we can take renewable electricity with all the intermittency or off-peak grid power, convert that to heat, time shift it through storage, and then provide 24-7 green, reliable, cost-effective steam to industry. So allowing industry to decarbonize, replace the dependence on Russian gas, but also have that security that the operations will keep running. Sounds fascinating. And we'll get a bit further into the into the technology perhaps a little bit in in more detail a bit later on. I think, first of all, maybe it'd be interesting just to find out a little bit more about you, Tamsin, and what's your driving passion and how have you ended up in this position at Energy Nest? So I started my career in low carbon and did one of the first emission trades in BP. And so I've always had that passion about how can we decarbonize the energy space and be part of that. And my whole career, I've had my ambition is to be a leader of a future energy company. So that's, an, and I love making a big difference that have that purpose, having making a big difference and then leading teams of people to work together to achieve excellent things. So when I got a call about NG Nest out of the blue, I was really intrigued and really excited about being part of how to decarbonize industrial heat, this notoriously hard to abate sector, the next frontier, how to create a new business, a new market and the commercial technical offers we need to do. And then how to build a team of people who want to make a difference, make a difference to greenhouse gases, make a difference to creating and growing a new space. And that feeling we've had when we worked in a great team where people, there's a buzz and energy and you can do anything. And so that's why I not just answered the call, but have joined Energy Nest. So what did you do before you were at Energy Nest? So I've I've spent my life in the um, energy and utility business. So I have um, developed long range gas storage businesses turned around a gas production business in Morecambe um, and most recently was asset director for the water industry where we were looking about how to provide reliable resilient services in a changing climate and I think you know with that my passion is about how to I talked about you know develop fantastic teams how to take on really big challenges and find ways to solve them and then how to great create great you know great businesses and was uh, was in the water uh, side was there storage involved in water as well yes in the water system there are huge amounts of storage um, and uh, the the delight of working there is you get to know a lot about it so from the really big storage of the reservoirs through to actually more um, in-day storage and service reservoirs. So a huge amount of buffering to ensure that every time we turn our tap on, clean drinking water comes out. So it seems like storage is a common is a common theme maybe throughout throughout uh, a lot of the career anyway. And, and what a it's the ultimate technical commercial challenge or, or interest. How to find that way of time shifting, in this case energy. And uh, you're right. I mean, industrial decarbonisation is uh, decarbonisation of heat in general, and decarbonisation of industrial heat is a you know major topic, major issue. I, I know we're still got a long way to go on decarbonising the electricity sector, but I think we know what we're going to do. I think we've got a plan, and there are different options, of course, and probably we need everything thrown at it. But at, at least it's a bit clearer, I would say, than how we are going to uh, decarbonise industrial heat. So with that, I will hand over to Alex. To start with, the first question really is, is the decarbonisation of heat really as hard as people think it is? Or are people just unfamiliar with it? And actually, there are a bunch of solutions already there that are already kind of already deployable and they just need a bit of impetus. 
absolutely the critical question. And, and I think, you know, my experience since joining NGS is there are deployable technologies today that are commercial propositions and attractive. And part of the challenge and the opportunity is how to accelerate the adoption within industry um, and to recognize the range of technologies that will be needed from hydrogen playing its part in particularly very high temperature through to heat pumps for lower temperature demands. And then systems like Energy Nest, whose sweet spot is steam within the range of 150 to 400 degrees. So approximately half of industrial heat demand. Leading on from that, where do you see, how do you see the decarbonisation of the industrial sector going forward to the extent it differs in different time horizons? It would be great to hear your thoughts on where we go from here for the next five years and then longer term, sort of 20, 30 years. Yeah, and maybe I can just start with the next 12 months because I think we recognise we're in times that we probably couldn't, or some people will have imagined, but many of us just couldn't imagine. And so the immediate opportunity is with the Russian gas crisis, how to solve the challenge of surviving without Russian gas, you know, economically surviving without Russian gas and keeping industry going and decarbonizing at the same time, rather than replacing that by other baked in fossil fuel options. And so solutions like Energy Nest, which are available today, can provide that ability to take abundant renewables and support the growth of renewables, but time shift and manage the intermittency to provide stable heat in a more cost-effective way than other forms of, of electricity storage. So I think you know the opportunity we have, and this is why I'm so pleased to be here, is about how do we raise that awareness that the only answer isn't either I have to take electricity at whatever price it is, minute by minute or second by second, or hydrogen, which is available in the future, or gas at the prices today. But there are other answers that play their role in the energy mix. And I guess an obvious pushback in the short term is simply that the cost of power is really very high, in a large part because it gets generated by a 50% efficient gas power station, which until you get heat pump-like efficiencies from the, the heat generation from electricity, it, it's hard to overcome that. So is, is that much of a barrier or is the pressure from Ukraine so strong that this is a question of gas or no gas, not what the price is? For some people, it's a question of you know heat or no heat, particularly those industries that are facing the prospect of gas rationing. You know, and I think you know we all recognise how how concerning that must be for them. But you're absolutely right about this double challenge of high gas prices, high power prices. And I think this is where this ability to time shift energy and what the role Energy Nest can play comes in. So we can take cheap electricity at abundant times, whether it's at midday in Spain, as the, as the sun shining, in the middle of the night where there's less demand, and provide that cheap, the, the cheapest four hours of the day or less to charge the battery to put the energy in and then provide that stable 24-hour steam on the other side. So these opportunities to provide demand-side management or manage the intermittency of renewables will become, we believe, more and more important as, as there are more renewables and, and the electricity mix evolves. I just wonder if we could go into a little bit of the, of the technical details there, because you mentioned the four hours and so on. What's the, what are the sort of technical parameters for the storage systems you have? Yeah, so the first thing is our, our system is we describe it's like Lego. So if you imagine con shipping containers, each module's a shipping container. And in there, there are pipes that do the heat transfer surrounded by a special type of concrete that stores the heat. And we can stack those ranging from very small applications of around 10 modules up to thousands where we think about the application of offshore wind into a big industrial chemical plant or thermal storage, um, th thermal storage power in Spain. So that modular ability to go from small to, if you imagine, a football pitch with stacks of these shipping containers storing and discharging heat. And then in terms of how, how our system works, we take electricity, we convert it to heat in an e-boiler, which is a widely available technology, we store that. 
And one of the key things of our system is that we can provide effectively instantaneous charge and discharge. So, that, so we can provide that ability to take heat or put heat or change the heat profile almost instantaneously. And that's through some very, very clever technology that involves the ability to discharge what's called live steam, which means dry steam, which is particularly important in many chemical applications and other applications. Well, that's, that's probably going beyond my technical capability, the uh, difference between dry steam and, uh, and wet steam. Do you know what applications it is important for dry steam? Uh, yes. I mean, really important for industrial applications, especially important for chemical plants and also in thermal power stations. And you talked about the instantaneous response. Are there other uses outside of, for your energy nest technology outside of the industrial sector and sort of simply, quote unquote, producing steam? We can produce steam in any any setting or also store steam. So I think another application is around the ability to take steam in thermal power generation. So, for example, waste to energy, allow base load running of this, the, power, the steam generation, but then store that energy as heat and discharge it to the power turbines at points of either very high prices in the power market or to support capacity markets with six to eight hours storage duration. So effectively taking what we would typically think of as an inflexible power station and making it relatively somewhat more or a lot more flexible. Exactly, a lot more flexible. And I think that bit of storage being able to provide flexibility, whether it's flexibility on the input side or flexibility on the output side, is absolutely the crux of what we do. And we can see in this world and the energy mix as, as it's evolving, how important that's going to be. And then the, the in terms of the, the steam going into a steam turbine, I'm assuming, if I remember correctly, a lot of power stations, they have three sets of steam turbines for different temperature and heat. First one's at the highest pressure, highest temperature. Do you know which stage you're at? Yes. So at the moment with our with with our offer, that goes into the second and third stages. Um, but still with that small efficiency loss, about 20%, it's still a much better commercial proposition than, than we believe a lithium-ion battery. Um, and obviously, as we, as we grow and evolve, we continue to undergo research and development into can we have a store at higher, higher temperatures as well. So, uh, you know, watch the space. You, you touched on lithium-ion batteries there. I mean, one of the issues is the rarity and, I guess, the cost of lithium. I suppose concrete is, by comparison, cheap and abundant. Um, but equally, it's not. The, I wouldn't say it's the first choice of material for a company that's aiming to sort of go green um, and enable an energy transition. Yeah. What are your thoughts on on that? So maybe if I answer the first question, so the carbon payback of our system, which is concrete and steel, two typically high, you know high CO two products, is under two months. So there's a very very fast carbon footprint payback. For, for our system. Um, it's also, you know, why, as you say, widely available. It, it's carbon and steel. The carbon footprint of those will go down as those sectors, the industrial sectors, decarbonize. And I think the final point is it's entirely recyclable. So that full, you know, confidence over the whole life cycle sourcing and then, and then the decommissioning and where the material goes you know, is something we have absolute confidence in. Is it also something that might last a long time? Yes. So our thermal storage systems will last 30 plus years, are designed to do you know, hundreds of thousands of cycles, if not millions, with absolutely no degradation of performance. So this is the beauty, um, you know, very high, high manufacturing quality, a special type of concrete that doesn't degrade and has been tested at um, in Mazdar and Abu Dhabi to confirm this. You know, there's no cracking or other sort of issues with the concrete. And then the, I think you mentioned uh, thermal storage, and I'm thinking probably that's uh, with regard to concentrating solar power, which isn't it isn't so popular these days as uh, as as it once was. I I would assume, although there's still quite a lot of activity, as you mentioned, in Spain. 
And there it's uh, in competition with molten salt storage, I assume. That's right. And our app, you know, our thermal energy storage is around half the cost of molten salt. As someone who's operated high hazard plants, I can say I'd, I would much rather operate our very stable um, thermal batteries rather than a molten salt system. And again, no issues with um, the scarcity of supply, the high cost. And again, the modular system allows that ability to scale up to meet what's the optimum sizing and also increase that for the concentrated solar power plants. And then fairly easy to relocate as well, the technology. Can you pick up a container and drop it somewhere else if the world moves on and changes? So, yes, it's possible. I, I think, you know, there will always be it's, it's the, the, the um, convincing people about the quality of secondhand equipment. So that's not our primary primary business. But, you know, that ability to recycle, uh, absolutely. I'm just thinking, you know, in a lot of energy assets are not easy to move, and certainly containerized uh, reciprocating gas engines and um, and batteries that can be moved around. I think it it gives an extra benefit, especially as if you imagine you had a battery that was, in electricity terms, relieving constraints and the world changed, you could always pick it up and drop it somewhere else. I'm not sure what the equivalent would be for uh, for heat storage, whereby maybe the maybe the um, the sector no longer makes sense uh, within a certain location and uh, and they decide to relocate somewhere else, can they take uh, some of the kit with them? It would, be, uh, it would still be useful, I think. Yeah, absolutely, and, and certainly possible. Right now, I can imagine the economics of electrifying industrial heat remain somewhat challenging. Even if you could organise the right offtake agreements with renewables producers, there really isn't that much offshore wind available um, to generate lots and lots of very low prices. What do you think needs to be done in the next five years and then in the next sort of 20 years from a policy side to really facilitate industrial decarbonisation? Yes, and I think there's a couple of parts of that. So one is around supported policy frameworks for alternatives to create routes to market for large-scale renewables to a form of energy supply, so in this case, industrial heat, rather than automatically through grids, where we know that grid upgrades are expensive and take a long time. So I think the first thing is around that right policy framework, and we're seeing the start of it in the offshore wind bids in the Netherlands, where part of it, part of the bid is about the system integration. So that, that supportive framework to say, how do we find new routes to market for offshore renewables or large scale renewables? And the displacement of gas and industrial heat is just a huge sector that allows large growth in renewables into an application we need. I think then in the near term, there are some other things around um, avoiding unintended consequences. So typically, a lot of um, environmental costs, decarbonisation costs, are put on electricity rather than gas, creating, again, another perverse incentive not to move to decarbonised electricity for this. And then the third thing, I think, is really around making sure the value that this time shifting, whether it's demand side management or that scale up of renewables, is, is properly priced into any framework. This will be betraying my lack of knowledge about the industrial sector, but is there much value to the industrial sector itself from that flexibility outside of power pricing? So it depends on the application. For the industrial sector, the primary thing is, can I be confident my factory is going to operate today and tomorrow? And so what we can do is provide that confidence while not needing to have 24-7 power in. So, so the, the time shiftings from intermittent inputs to confidence my factory is going to run. There are other applications in steam balancing in an industrial complex where actually that ability, so rather than dumping waste heat to sea or some other sink, can be stored, captured and then repurposed. You know, that again, are highly attractive, you know, particularly in today's environment. And I suppose on that latter point, is that something where you see more opportunities in the short term? Because I guess that's already energy that is being wasted um, that 
industrial customers could make better use of is that so our, our first port of call at the moment is around with the need to reduce gas use in europe how can we provide that heat european industry needs to operate through an alternative means um, because that's the place we think we can make the biggest impact on global greenhouse gas emissions and europe's economy today there are these other applications that we think are important, but have less scale and less, you know, significance in making that real, you know, real step change in how do we decarbonise heat in industry. And the question, I suppose, there is the is the interplay between electricity and gas markets, isn't it? And and to what extent the electricity will be there if the gas isn't there? And obviously, there's the more options on the electricity side than uh, than on the gas side. I, I would say, but you're still you're still potentially this winter looking at a looking at a, a fairly scarce product even on the electricity side. I suppose it might be a difference between being rationed uh, and not being able to run your factory, or being able to buy some electricity at a high price and still run the factory. And that's a, a trade off, I suppose. Each each you know in, industrial company will need to make in that situation and probably with that like everything this winter will be will it will be a case of getting through it making difficult decisions but what we have is an amazing opportunity to think about next winter and the winter afterwards and we're seeing that in in the gas prices so what would it take to unlock in spain or in a sunny location a neighbouring field with solar panels going into industrial heat, you know, or onshore wind, or even accelerating some of the offshore wind won't be for this winter. But what would it take to do that, particularly the sort of the, the quick to develop as long as the permitting works of near term renewables? And we need to see still more work on the uh, on the ability to build, certainly in the UK, onshore wind and speed up permitting in general across Europe, I think, to be able to deal with this crisis. Uh, the other thing I, I, I guess you've picked up on is a lot of talk about decoupling of gas and electricity prices in Europe. Um, and one would presume that that would be good news for, uh, for, for this system if there was a decoupling, if electricity prices weren't so linked to gas prices in future. I'm very aware I'm talking to experts in the electricity market here, uh, and I have, uh, of which I'm absolutely not. So, um, you know, what to say, I, I think, you know, this, the, what we offer is that ability to take for certain periods of the day, cheap, cheap electricity when it's abundant. You know, whether the proposals about full decoupling, you know, have unintended consequences and whether they're the right thing. Quite honestly, I, I am not the person to de define that. But I think that ability to be able to find sources of flexibility that can capture the energy when the sun shines or the wind blows and provide that in useful forms of energy, you know, when it's dark or when the wind stops blowing is absolutely essential as we look at, at the you know the the wider energy mix. I suppose I'm just I'm sort of trying to play off those those trade offs in my in my mind. I haven't quite done it yet to know which uh, what the unintended cons consequences might be if you do decouple. But there's a lot of places talking about it, and even in uh, the GB uh, Rema uh, electricity market consultation, people talking about split markets and uh, average cost pricing and all, all of these sorts of things. It's certainly a very hot topic right now. It seems to me that the the, the inherent flexibility is is going to have a value, whether it's a crisis period or or not. You know, and as you look forward, being able to connect up local renewables to a system that you know gives you more security and certainty can only be a good thing. But it all sounds terribly positive, Tamsin. I'm asking myself, where what's the you know? It all sounds wonderful. There must be, you know, where's the catch? There must be something, surely. And I, you know, I, I, I dare say, you, you know, you're going to tell me there isn't one. No, th there is a catch. So let me share. I got a phone call to say, would you be interested in talking to this thermal energy storage company? And had this phone call not come from someone that I deeply respect, I'd have said, what, you know, and probably said, you know, thank you. And I think this thing about 
thermal energy storage and this application is just not known. And the classic, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So for me, the, the two, you know, you asked about the challenges, it's how do we raise awareness? We are part of the solution. And then secondly, with that, you know, how do we, that, you know, so that's it, find, find the, and then who are the people who want to, you know, be pioneers and to take, you know, move away from what's been a very, you know, very secure, stable, confident form of energy and suddenly the world's tipped on its head in the last 12 months. Yeah, but it's still, I still, you know, having said that, obviously challenges of getting the word out there, um, making, you know, making people aware. In terms of the cost, would you say, I mean, you say it's cost competitive with molten salts and I don't know what else I would compare it with in terms of decarbonized heat uh, as an option you know, to, to, to say whether it's, you know, because obviously we, we don't have so much green hydrogen already uh, hanging about, you know, and uh, I'm just wondering how will that evolve over time? And if there is a lot of blue and green hydrogen in future, will, um, will Energy Nest still have the, the, the position? Will the cost be coming down? So like everyone, you know, our costs are coming down already and will continue. Um, you know, if I look today, we're certainly more cost, you know, cost effective or uh, cost effective compared with current gas prices. That's not a surprise. Mm-hmm. And, and um, but we are, we're getting to be cost comparable to a more concern, a lower long run gas price, um, gas price and CO2. And that's really the the you know where we've set our, our targets is how can we compete against gas, and with that being much lower than hydrogen. I talked about you know much lower than molten salt, and actually a much more cost effective form of storage for thermal power plants than lithium ion batteries. Mm. So so scaling up will help reduce costs. I mean it might be that I suppose in absolute terms costs can vary year on year. I mean, I imagine at the moment the cost of making concrete is probably a lot higher than it was. It's certainly higher now than it's been. But but still at the point where, you know, we are confident in our, you know, in in the pricing model, where it's available today and it works today. Yeah. And what sort of scale, you know, if uh, if someone wanted to buy, uh, you know, a thousand... um, containers of, of uh, energy of thermal storage can you manu- can you make that today is there a plan for scaling up so we have factories already to make the cassettes we've got um, partnerships with concrete manufacturers so we and we are manufacturing them today and then because it's factory built that ability to scale fast and locally, is very easy to do. And again, that's a beauty of the design of what we do. So uh, today our factory is in um, Rotterdam, you know, and again, we can uh, copy, you know, copy that and, and multiply that in, in different locations. And I'm, you know, the other thing I'm conscious of, because I've, I've been uh, looking looking more closely at it, is the, is the future for uh, green tech in terms of in, in the light of the current geopolitical situation, when we think about solar PV or electrolyzers or um, uh, you know batteries, lithium ion batteries, then looking forward, potential issues arising with where the raw materials are are, are being mined, you know where they're coming from, who's supplying those, you know who are the who are the parties we're buying. Uh, lithium from um, you know high grade nickel from, and uh, and then also in terms of manufacturing solar PV manufacturing being largely centred in in China, I can see a certain amount of reshoring of, um, of of say solar PV manufacturing, but some of the key technologies rely on rare earth minerals, for instance, which are which are found in certain locations. It sounds to me like this you know another plus point is that um, you're not dependent on those sorts of things looking forward? Absolutely not. So manufactured currently in Europe, but with the opportunity to manufacture locally anywhere in the world, abundantly available materials, concrete, steel. And so that security of supply and confidence in the the social impact of both the, the sourcing of the materials 
the manufacturing of it and then the recycling is something you know we can be absolutely confident in. Very good. Alex, anything more from you? Yeah, just on the point about scalability, and obviously the, the storage modules in the containers are quite easy to scale. How difficult is it to plug it into an industrial site? Not very difficult at all. So it requires, it's effectively imagine there's a gas boiler today, a very big one that runs and generates steam that has a tie-in to the industrial complex or the factory. We would be building something beside that. And it's two things. It's a tie over of the, the actual physical connection and then an integration into the control systems of the factory. And both of these are done routinely, you know, in a number of in a number of different applications. So those are that's again, you know, that beauty of the system integration, the confidence your factory will continue to run is something again, you know, it's it's a very simple connection. So it particularly doesn't need any process re-engineering or anything like that. It's kind of remove old stuff, yeah. put in new stuff. So when people have got gas boilers that are needing refurbishing or retiring, this is a perfectly viable sort of decision for that business to take. It might be to say, well, we have one gas boiler, maybe we electrify this one, we keep one gas boiler for example. Exactly. One other question from my side on... I mean, on hydrogen. Is hydrogen really a competitor? I think what will play out is hydrogen has its place, particularly in you know, either very high heat situations um, or where there's a need for, for seasonal storage, long, really long duration storage. So I think hydrogen will absolutely play, play its role. We firmly believe in all of the data we've seen is that hydrogen is and will be a much more expensive source of heat for this 150 to 400 degrees Celsius, you know, or, or below that. And so I think um, the competition is people are very aware of hydrogen rather than it's a real economic, you know, challenge to us. It's very popular these days, hydrogen, uh, from, uh, from what I can see. There's a very polarised views on on both sides, as I guess they're, they're the evangelists and and then those who, who, who view hydrogen as the, the least bad alternative for things that are really hard to do. I guess it sounds like you fit more in that camp. I firmly believe, you know, equally I don't think um, thermal energy storage and energy nest is the single answer. I think, you know, what we'll see in the energy transition is we'll need a number of different technologies that work, to, you know, work together. So I, I certainly wouldn't camp, pound myself in the anti-hydrogen camp I think we need to be careful of thinking anything is a is the nirvana to solve all of our problems. And are there are there other companies with the same you know do you have competitors with the same sort of technology out there? Yes, we do, and actually we see that as a really good good sign that it's a market people are seeing opportunity in. Uh, there's a lot of gas to replace, and so to be in a competitive landscape, and again that you know that ability to have a bigger influence as a, as a technology or an application is a, is a good thing, we think. Very interesting. Very good. Sounds fabulous, the technology. I'm not sure we've been able, with all our questions, to find a, a much, of a, much of a downside to, to the idea. So I, th I think it can only leave it to me to thank you, Tamsin, very much for, for talking to us. Thank you. Well, thank you. What a delight and great conversation. And uh, thank you, Alex, as well. It's been uh, excellent having you on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please do uh, subscribe to the podcast. It's available on all, uh, all the usual channels, which you probably know because you would have found this uh, on one of the channels probably. And we hope to welcome you next time. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.